I'm just so ready for folks who are in positions, you know, counselors, psychiatrists, all healthcare professionals, the healthcare industry as a whole to start listening to people and validating their experiences. And I, I understand you're a therapist and you are treating folks who have PSSD. And um, so tell me, I mean, how'd you, how'd you get into this line of work? Yeah. So um, be, I am a registered clinical counselor with the BC Association of Clinical Counselors. That's the province I'm in here in Canada. Also, I'm a social worker. So um, um, I, um, I have my, my education is in social work. Um, so I, I work with folks with PSSD. Um, I specialize in working with this population. Um, I aim to work from a trauma-informed approach that aims to validate people's experiences I understand a lot of folks with PSSD have extreme difficulty finding healthcare providers who truly listen and take the time to understand their experience and understand PSSD. Um, so yeah, I um, a huge part of try of the work I try to do is to sort of counteract the systemic minimization and dismissal that people with PSSD all too frequently encounter, um, which can range from you know just understanding and validating their experience supporting them to take positive action or navigating conversations with other healthcare providers, family and friends with respect to PSSD. Um, and yeah, I, I understand that it can deeply impact people's um, self-worth and can be just a huge immense loss um, and often includes a grieving process. So supporting people with that process. Um, and um, the, I really, yeah, I appreciate that the, um, that the lack of awareness about PSSD in healthcare um, and society, as well as the shame and stigma associated with it, um, can compound that suffering and contribute to the experience of increased alienation and isolation. And um, so, um, yeah, and that, that all of this can be so much more distressing than the true anxiety or depression or mental health issues that people were originally seeking SSRI medication for. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I just really believe that people deserve to be really radically validated and the depth of the sense of loss needs to be acknowledged and creating space for the rage, grief, devastation, and any other emotion that comes with the experience. Um, well, well look, sorry, let, let me interrupt. I want to, I want to just say, how did this issue even turn up on your radar? You know, cause there's lots of people that work in your line of work who don't, uh, who haven't come across this. Tell me your story. How, how did this happen? Yeah. Um, so I, I had a patient with this condition and, um, I, I definitely come from sort of my theoretical orientations tend to be uh, a little bit more um, critical of the mainstream psychiatry biomedical model approach. And in social work, we're sort of trained to look at other factors influencing mental health apart from just the, the biological uh, determinism mm -hmm. <laughs> and that you see in medicine. And so looking at um, the environmental context and um, trauma and things like that. Um, and so having a patient with this um, and walking through her journey, coming from a place of curiosity and compassion and really acknowledging what I don't know. I think a lot of the times in these kinds of positions of, of where we're, you know, of relative authority, um, whether you're a physician or a counselor or something like that, it can be, it's not part of enough, enough of a part of a training to uh, acknowledge what we don't know and to come from that, to acknowledge that from a place of humility. Well, let me say this, because this is kind of like a story within itself. Believe me, I know a lot of social workers who kind of go through this model and they have this kind of leaning, but, um, no, it sounds it, and I may be wrong here, but it sounds like uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you kind of came into your line of work already, kind of critical of the medical model of mental health and 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 things like that, and questioning it and all of that. So I think that's yeah. kind of a story within itself. T tell us about that. How you kind of started going off in that direction? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. um, I've always been like pretty social justice oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, and I found myself working before working in private practice, like I do now, I found myself working, um, really nerding out about um, stigma busting in my job in an abortion clinic, where there was a lot of shame around mm -hmm. people's medical choices in that environment. Um, that gave me a great um, passion and interest in people experiencing um, entrenched systemic um, 
shame around their sexual and reproductive health. And so that was a really interesting experience. I really loved working in that environment. I learned so much from the people I was working with um, coming from like an anti-oppressive feminist trauma-informed approach that was very much um, centering the voices of the patients and the population that we're working with and um, uplifting the lived experience um, and the preferences and needs and um, desires of the of the folks who are working with. And so the environment in that non nonprofit setting where um, I was working was very much um, um, an anomaly <laughs> in terms of some of the, you know, work cultures of some um, other medical spaces um, that one might find themselves working in. Um, so the ethics and principles and values and approaches that I um, had the opportunity to uh, learn from, from my colleagues there, um, really deepened my passion mm -hmm. for um, understanding sexual health and other healthcare concerns um, from, from a lens that really uh, um, centers the patient and really um, acknowledges the, the added trauma that stigma and shame can create. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, in a really like controversial, you know, very controversial medical setting. Um, so when getting my training and, and working as a mental health professional, well, then seeing PSSD as this intersection of this injury intersects at um, two areas of healthcare, sexual health and mental health that are in my, I would argue, are the most stigmatized areas and devalued areas of healthcare where people are most likely to be trivialized and marginalized and excluded um, from participating in ethical decision-making um, in um, both their treatment and then also policy mm -hmm. around how this kind of care is administered. Um, so yeah, the, the parallels were there and I, yeah, starting to listen, there's no other therapists working with this population. So the word spread in the community pretty quickly that there was somebody out there doing this. Um, and so very quickly I had the huge privilege of being able to, um, yeah, um, speak with a range of people and, and families. Um, that's something that is huge. Um, there's such little support for the families of people suffering with this. Um, so let me ask you this, I guess today, you know, roughly how many people do you think you've spoken to with uh, PSSD so far? I would say I've spoken to about um, 15, 20 people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, ha and out of those, like how many would you say that you've, I guess, had a treatment relationship with where you've been able to follow them over several months? A dozen. Okay. That's, see, that's really interesting. And that's what I want to ask you about. Uh, you know, I do these interviews, but you know, so I, I check back in with some of these folks just on a more, you know, a personal, uh, you know, correspondence, but what does this look like over time? You know, um, it, it, do, do you see improvements? Does it stay much the same? W what do you see in Great this? Great question. Yeah. Yeah. So it really ranges. Um, for some people, they do um, find better ways to like manage and cope. It really depends on the symptom profile and um, the other barriers they're experiencing that they, what, where they came into the diagnosis with. Um, like for some people, yeah, it really depends on, on the symptoms a lot of the time. And some people seem to have find a way to like carry forward with a certain level of, you know, remaining zest for life. Um, and then there's some people, especially if they have the cognitive and emotional symptoms, I find the cognitive and emotional symptoms, the most challenging for people, actually the sexual, um, chemical castration and sexual symptoms are horrific and absolutely um um just harrowing but the in terms of the way that the emotional and cognitive symptoms get in the way of people being able to participate in society and participate in life uh, really affects such a fundamental aspect like being able to go to work being able to engage relationally being able to have relationships it's really so impossible to describe the depths of um alienation and isolation and um 
bear the the challenges that people who no longer have their emotions um like what that does really um if you still if you don't have your sexuality but you still have your emotions you can still have relationships of some kind you can still have a have access to like meaning and enjoy certain activities, a lot of activities. Um, but if you don't have your emotions anymore, there's such a core part of your humanity that's been stripped and hearing these stories of these experiences of this as experiences of this. Cause a lot of these relationships are on ongoing that I have with people because the PSSD doesn't really resolve. And so it's a lot of kind of ongoing kind of support at some, somebody who actually believes them and isn't gaslighting them and minimizing them who they can actually talk to about it um and so a lot of these in relationships are quite enduring um it, honestly it it i don't know how else to describe it as all all apart from like it what it can do to people it's like a sci-fi horror novel what it it's a, yeah it is it's an lives. absolute horror show um, it's what and let me ask you this what, what, what do you think about like the name psd because the thing that you were describing is mostly emotional and cognitive. And when I talk to a lot of people, I see the sicker ones, I, I imagine. And that's most of what they talk about. I mean, what do you think about it? it you know, the condition even being called PSSD when, you know, most people say that it's the cognitive and emotional problems, which they're bothered by. Yeah, it's, it's, such a misnomer and it's so unfortunate because it excludes so much of the experience and so much of the injury that this can cause and then further I think yeah it can just trivialize the the experience in such a comprehensive way and so um and it's so devastating because the cognitive and emotional symptoms are more easily um, attributed to the underlying mental health concern that somebody was originally seeking treatment for like your depression or whatever so it, it, um, without that being included in the, um, in the term, um, yeah, it, I think it makes the fight for patients to be understood and believed that much harder. Um, and so, yeah, I think it should just be, um, I, I believe in, you know, patients I've spoken with think it should just be called post SSRI brain damage, like process SSRI nerve system, um, uh, something <laughs> um, yeah no i i agree because because sometimes i'll talk to some people and you know sexual function is somewhat resolved you know after they've had had it for a while but they're still having lingering cognitive and emotional problems and that's that's really the um the main thing is you know you know going through life feeling disconnected like an alien or a robot you know just kind of or watching a movie and you know not feeling any you know it just it feels the whole thing feels unreal you know yeah um yeah. and and so i guess i have one patient who has a lot of these problems and you know we check in mostly for supportive work but also some other things but how do you how do you um how do you support these people you know when they when they come to you now that you've got a you know you know 12 of them and you're kind of familiar with the condition what what is the therapeutic work that you do to help someone cope who who has one of these conditions? Good question. Honestly, it really ranges based on where the person is at in like where they're at in their in in their process of acceptance, and mm -hmm. um, in terms of what their support looks like outside of our relationship. If they have other people in their life that they can talk to about this, um, a lot of it is um almost like just a space where people know they're not they're going to be validated and they can actually talk to somebody who's informed about the different advocacy and research and how they're feeling about that and um you know what's happening in the community and um just processing like the reality of the fact that there is hope out there there's more people getting prescribed these medications so there's going to be more people talking about it they're not going anywhere anytime soon, I don't think, unfortunately. So the inevitability is that there's just going to be more people with this condition overall over time. And although um, a lot of, obviously a lot of research is funded by industry, there's some research that's funded by other institutions. And so there hopefully will be more research underway. I'm a part of a couple of projects myself. And so um, the we, I mean, the BBC has just done this little expose as well. So that, I mean, a year or two ago, that would have been just 
we would have thought the community would have thought, okay, maybe in five to 10 years, the BBC will pick this up, right? So there is momentum happening in terms of awareness and research. It's obviously not fast enough, but, you know, having really honest conversations about like, yeah, this is a really terrible situation and not minimizing or trivializing it. I think a lot of people are in environments where there's just almost so much of a desire to just, you know, only focus on the hope or whatever, which is, you know, coming from a good place, but then it minimizes the actual experience of how little hope there actually really is this could not resolve this might this might not be something that we have treatment for that's very possible and so really grappling with that reality and what that means for people's lives yes they might get better but some people might not uh, we just don't know we can't we, there's no promises and so um i i think it's deeply valuable for people to just be have be able to have like honest conversations around all of that and and be listened to and heard and um, to be able to navigate, um, have a space where they can navigate conversations with healthcare providers, getting diagnoses, talking about how do they speak to their families about this, navigating relationships, depending on their symptom profile. They may try to enter the dating scene. Okay. What does it mean to have a conversation with your sexual partner about the fact that you don't feel your genitals, um, you know, all kinds of sort of day-to-day things people experience. Um, and then, um, yeah, it really, it just really ranges on the per with the person, but, um, there's no actual, it's more about the validation and emotional processing and grief process and, um, supporting kind of what, what functioning can look like and keep what he keeping hope alive can look like and finding meaning despite all of this. Finding um, meaning uh, is really important for me. You know, when I, because not not just with the PSSD folks, but anyone who's been severely drug drug injured, sometimes it's almost you know a combination of anger you know against the medical system that takes them to advocacy or a desire to want to prevent other people from going through it that ends up being the thing you know almost like the life raft that they grab onto. Um, yeah. Because it's uh, you know no no surprise that people can be highly suicidal and and sometimes even you know going for things like assisted suicide I know they do that in Europe I mean have have you come encounter have you had encounters with people who are highly suicidal who are or who are seeking uh, physician assisted suicide uh, I I certainly know I have you know on, on my side I don't know if that's happened yeah. to you yet yeah yeah I have yeah so nobody seeking physician assisted suicide um but folks because um yeah i'm in um operating in north america it's the accessibility is different for that um but um folks who are highly suicidal and i might have one client that has passed away might as and might, might have ended their life i'm not in contact with them but um that's very likely what has happened um because that contact was quite regular and because of the challenges involved in supporting people in that dimension of the illness and that place that they're in, there's certain limitations on what I can and can't offer in terms of, um, you know, not wanting to, yeah, I don't want to be in a position where I am, um, calling, <laughs> calling 911 on somebody who's been so harmed by that system. And so, um, yeah, there's sort of boundaries I have to have around, um, what I can and can't talk about with people. So, um, sure. yeah, it is definitely, a constant suicidal ideation um is something that people are constantly dealing with and it's um it's really tricky because um i think unless you're experiencing the particular profile of symptoms that somebody is experiencing in an enduring fashion can only only then can you decide if life is worth living if you're in that if you're in that experience and so um it's extremely complex it's and it's such a range in what people experience. The cognitive, emotional, and sexual symptoms all are very varied and can come and go. Like I have, I have a client that really like just have such huge windows and waves. They sometimes feeling relatively normal, and then we'll have a crash, and that will be so destabilizing. And so many symptoms will come alive, um, and be enduring for a while, and then it'll get better. And so the roller coaster is so wild for people to experience because it gives a sense of hope that oh, I'm getting better. And then they'll be, um, they'll be, um, attacked with a storm of symptoms once more. And so that's what that can do to somebody's psyche is so 
cruel. I find it's already hard enough to grapple with the symptoms that one has, but then had to have that sort of false hope and then have the symptoms come back and then them no longer to be able to have their emotions or memory or things like that. After having access to that and thinking that they're getting better, it just creates this roller coaster of t- volatility that I think it takes such, such, such strength to withstand. So even though one might say, okay, if your symptoms are fixed, you know, maybe that's more of a, yeah, I just don't think it's necessarily easier if you're, there's really no, no easy, there's no easy road with this condition, I guess. I, I'd agree with that, that one of the most challenging things is this kind of start and stop, you know, periods. And you know, again, this is a bit broader than PSSD, but uh, with with the other drug injuries that it kind of comes and goes and it puts me in a position where I like to be optimistic you know I want to tell people you know you can heal from this you can recover you know this wave will be your last but it's you know it's like striking that balance because you know I work with so many people who you know they kind of go in and out and then it's almost if you're too kind of optimistic about it then they start saying oh, wow, you know, I must be so much worse than other people or there's something particularly severe about what I have, which is a a worse prognosis. And it's not the case. It's just the very unfortunate, you know, fact that a lot of these conditions, these drug withdrawal ones and PSSD kind of come up and down and really in unpredictable ways. And the other thing is, and and, and then some of your clients kind of have this on-off thing, they start to become very fixated on, or was it this food that I ate or was it this medication or was it this mm-hmm. place that I stayed in with mold? Mm-hmm. And, um, and then it kind of tortures people's minds because they, 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 they start to look for things in their surroundings that may have attributed to the, to the next wave. Yeah. Um, and, and oftentimes it's, it, it's just par for the course, really. It's the, the nature of the condition and, and, and how it, how it recovers over time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you phrased it so perfectly, this piece around striking that balance. I find it, you know, obviously you always want to remember that there's hope out there, but then also, you know, acknowledging the depth and the gravity of the situation. I think people start to feel triggered and alienated when there's sort of too much talk around only hope and not around like the, the depths of what this could be, you know, um, and the unknowns, because there's oh, yeah. the fact that we don't know. Every, we just don't every know. Time, every time you say, hey, everyone recovers, you know, believe me, there's a bunch of people out there at the five-year mark that are just going, uh, you know, well, what about me? You yeah, know, I've had people with this for decades um, yeah. that were poisoned as children um, and haven't gotten better. And so in order to like honor the depth of experience that people have, you know, we just, we don't know. We don't know. There's when we have to be honest about what we don't know. And so yeah, there's that piece around striking that balance about being honest about what we don't know and, and, um, but remaining hopeful. And then also, yeah, this piece around people attributing, you know, uh, scanning the environment and thinking of everything that could have contributed, could have contributed to a crash or a wave. And, um, it can, yeah, just the fixation on that can just be so draining and so challenging and people can, it can, create such restriction and um a further um i guess how what's the word i'm looking for yeah i guess restriction on what people bring into their lives it can really make people's lives so much smaller if they're trying to control all of the variables that uh, you know was it this was it this that caused it was it this food was it this supplement and so yeah it just can be so incredibly distressing distressing and frustrating for people to, to just not have these answers. And it just feels like there's so many answers that people are looking for. And I wish I could give people more answers. The real, the truth is I can't. And a lot of it's people looking for answers. And I just have to be honest with I, what I know and I, what I don't know. And, um, yeah, it sucks. I just so wish that we had more research and more, more, um, more, um, resources going into this so that we can find out, we can find out more about it so that we can give people the information that they so desperately deserve. You mentioned you have a patient that has, um, has this and they were medicated as a child. Um, I, um, 
you know, and, and it reminds me of that. I mean, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I mean, we, we use a lot more medications, I, I guess, in the last, you know, 20, 30 years since the SSRIs came on the market, you know, very much seen to be safer uh, medications than the older antidepressants. And that kind of paved the way for them to be used more broadly and especially in children. And so now we have um, people your age, people my age, you know, who may have been on these medications when they were developing, you know, yeah. that's just, um, and that's what's kind of hitting the market now. Um, maybe not the market, at least the mental health, mental health professionals. Yeah. And I think about Robert Whitaker's book and how he talks about, um, uh, you know, that some of the medic, you know, some of the effects of medications may actually make uh, mental illness uh, chronic. You know, you could have temporary problems or perhaps even problems that children might have grown out of or, mm. or problems that were, you know, legitimate problems in their environment that may have been better addressed during other means. And now they kind of end up, you know, on these on these medications. And, and I often wonder, you know, I see, you know, I used to see a lot of treatment resistant depression is what it's called, mm -hmm. you know, people kind of cycling through several medications, getting on things like ketamine. And now I start to wonder whether, you know, some of these things are, I mean, if, you know, this, this, this type of, you know, we call it depression. I mean, depression is probably a bad word for what happens in PSSD because I see it more as this like intense kind of blunting and disconnection. Yeah. But I, I imagine a lot of other people would see that as depression. And and so I wonder like how much of the chronicity of mental illness that I'm seeing a lot more these days uh, that I'm hearing a lot more about is is actually, um, you know, potentially uh, iatrogenic, you know, from, from Absolutely. you Absolutely. Know, yeah. I have the same thoughts and concerns. Um, yeah. It's we just have this epidemic of people who have been medicated at a young age. And so we don't know bait their baseline. Um, and so there's, there's all these people who've been put on these medications who will never know, um, what the ways that their brains and bodies have been impacted by these medications because they were developing. And so, um, I think there's something so devastating about that. Not only are these people, you know, who are drugged as minors, not given informed consent, because you can't consent to lose something that you haven't developed yet. Mm -hmm. So if your sexuality and cognition and emotional uh, capacity isn't developed yet, you can't really consent to lose that and you can't consent to those risks. Um, and so not only is that stolen, um, but people don't have an understanding of, okay, what would my sexual say, my sexuality, what would that have been like? But if I had had a chance to develop it before being on these medications. So at least once if people get PSSD when they're adults, they know exactly what was done to them. Um, and they know what their body was like before, but for people who didn't get the chance to develop properly, my heart breaks in a really unique way for that experience because not knowing, not being able to really ever know that side of who you were supposed to be, but for this medication injury, um, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's really soul. It's a soul wound. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause I mean, if this is something that happens to you and, and, and like you said, you don't really have a baseline of a fully matured sexual, like uh physiology, you know, that might yeah. happen after adolescence, um, then um, you're going to go through this period of your life, seeing things work for other people, seeing, seeing natural like uh, chemistry and relationships form in your friends and, and have that not happen uh, for you and start feeling that there's something wrong with you. And, and I mean, that is um, obviously could in and of itself cause depression and put you at risk for other kind of mental health type problems. Um, and, um, you know, gosh, I, you know, I think about an interview I did with Simon and you may have been aware of his, his, article that came out recently i think it was in the telegraph or something like yeah, that yeah. where and when i interviewed for him first he said when he was going through some of this although he was heterosexual when he was in his teens and most of his 20s he began to question his sexuality he yeah. began to think you know maybe i'm you know maybe i'm gay because it's so hard for me to maintain you know a relationship with a woman or get an erection and things like that 
and it really affected him mentally. And I and I've spoken with many others who have had that same experience. And these are people who already know their baseline sexual orientation, or at least they had a couple of years under their belt at least. Um, with that, uh, start to be kind of thrust into this confusion. And you know, I see a lot of things like you know, like people are talking about asexuality now. Yeah. You know, there's a lot more um, gender fluidity and. And I don't want to discount the fact that that some of that is just due to the lack of stigma around that that wasn't there before and then that we're now talking about it more. But it is also an itch that I have in the back of my mind is like, you know, could this be also a consequence of people going through, I guess, sexual maturation on medications, which appear to have very potent effects on, um, uh, you know, on, on disrupting things like... Uh, uh, you know that feeling, you know that 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 sexual attraction and all of that. I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on on that. Oh yeah, no, I think it would be so fascinating to have some research around that. And even if it's yeah, I, I honestly um have no doubt that there's a percentage of people who have had their they have their sexuality blunted by these medications at a young age, and then are therefore questioning their sexuality and romantic orientation because of these medications. I mean, absolutely. Um, it, it can be it, these medications, they can, they can blunt the fat physical response system, but not the romantic side of things. They can still have romantic emotion. Um, and then I think for those folks, it's a little bit more clear, but for folks who are somewhere in between or cause all this is on a spectrum, um, the, sexual and romantic aspects are blunted. Um, it can be deeply, deeply challenging to unpack where somebody, what's, yeah, wh what somebody's true um, expression and orientation and identity would have been, but for these medications. And so it's, um, it's absolutely heartbreaking to think of how many people are, who don't know who are so young put on these medications when they were so young, they didn't, um, they don't know any difference. So they, and don't know about PSSD. So for some people who are sexually developed and then they have this injury, they very much are able to identify, okay, like something's different now and then do some Googling or whatever. Um, but for people who just were always different and, you know, because of these medications had this injury and never just developed properly, the process of so many of these people don't even know that PSSD exists or that, um, and all the other symptoms are possible. And so it's just unimaginable to think about how many, how many youth, how many people who are adults now, my age or older now and younger, but uh, are out there who, um, just don't have that connection to that part of themselves. And it's a deeply intimate, creative, vital part of oneself, their sexuality and their sexual expression and their romantic uh, experience. So to have varying degrees of access to that part of those parts of oneself, uh, um, the confusion that that, that can create. And I'm really, I'm really saddened to think about how many people actually do have medication injury, but just never would never know because they never had a chance to develop that baseline. I would love yeah. to have some research on that one day. Well, they get told, you know, you know, it's, it's a symptom of depression. M most likely um, is, is, is what they hear and they go, wow, I must be really, really sick and more and, and very depressed. And may maybe they even end up on more medication, but it's, I mean, essentially it, it, it like kind of cripples people in a way, because yes. if you, think about what the um you know what kind of one of the fundamental things that i think makes people feel at ease is um you know is that drive to connect to others you know and, and a lot of that is is romantic but uh you know P pssd doesn't just mess up romantic connections you know for many of the um people i talk to it's like even when they're just hanging out with their mates um you know that same like feeling that bond you know, that makes you kind of seek out those interactions with them. Mm -hmm. It's even that is blunted and yeah. the world becomes smaller and smaller. And then, you know, they, yeah, there's just less of that, that drive to connect in that way. And that, 
and that's really i mean yeah it's 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 awful um it's really devastating you know i know some of my clients i have they they just they don't feel genuine empathy compassion connection anymore they don't feel that in their minds hearts or bodies and so they have to if they're going to be in certain social spaces they really have to fake it and put on an act because they don't have access to that emotion. I have clients who say like, I could kill my, I could murder my family and I don't do it because like, I don't really want to. And it's like the wrong thing to do, but I I could do it and not have any emotion around it. Like it really creates like psychopathy adjacent uh, qualities and experiences in people where like that removal, that empathy deficit is so immense. And um so a lot of people just feel like so isolated and alienated and, and unable to describe that experience and unwilling to exert the energy to pretend to have these emotions and experiences. So they prefer to isolate. And then obviously that has its whole host of problems, but um, I, I, my heart just breaks for people who had this injury, who have lack of emotional resonance now who don't who reward the reward circuitries are corrupted by these drugs they can't feel joy and pleasure and connection um because of the medication but they're told it's their depression so the blame is put on their brains and they're told oh you need to just think your way out of it with cbt or try harder or do this or whatever it's in your mind rather than oh my goodness this iatrogenic injury you were you this you had an adverse reaction where you have neurological devastation that stops you from feeling feelings that you would otherwise, um, you know, that we can't, we can't, there's no therapy or intervention that's going to fix this. Um, it, like just the amount of people that are blaming themselves for having the lack of emotional depth and resonance, um, and inability to feel joy and pleasure who don't know about this injury, who are just thinking it's depression and then been going on a cycle of drugs that are likely, deepening and exacerbating the issues. Um, it, it's so scary to think about how many people out there in the world um, just would never to think to attribute this to the um, adverse effect from the medication. Yeah, it's, um, and I mean, some places that they, they, they can really hand these medications out quickly. I, I spoke with a uh, a resident physician, um, tenacious doc. I mean, it was an interview I did on my channel. Um, and he's a, a psychiatrist in training in India. And he was telling me about like the clinics there and, and, you know, like, what does it look like when you see, you know, 50 to 60 people a day? I mean, it's like, oh, you're depressed, you know, you know, write a script and go. So Absolutely. it's not just like a North America issue or a European issue. I mean, this, and particularly in places where they're, they are stretched for, um, well, well, that that that's the only kind of version of mental health care that you get. I mean, it's yeah, it's kind of all over the place. Um, I want to pivot and ask you a little bit about how do you keep people alive with this? I mean, I have my own kind of thought thoughts about it because I do a lot of this with my own cohort, not just um PSSD, which I actually don't don't really see, but but mostly my protracted withdrawal injury folks. Do you have a framework? Do you have a way that you kind of think about kind of building things up so so people don't go through with suicide and and things like that? Um, for me, it really like varies. I don't so much have a um a framework that I you I I lean into, but um, I guess I just um person to person basis. Um, I think it's important for people to have a space where they can talk to about some of these thoughts and feelings. Um, and a lot of the time people just want to know, want somebody to know how bad it really is that they're really in that acute place, but they don't want to act on it. And then for those people who, um, just, you know, it's more enduring. Um, I wish I was in a position. I desperately wish I was in a position where I could have more robust conversations with people about what that process might look like for them and how what medical assisted suicide what that process might be what they're considering on a philosophical spiritual dimension um and yeah my unfortunately my practice limits me from being able to have conversations about 
um, deep conversations around like immediacy around suicide or planning. Um, but I wish that that wasn't the case so that people wouldn't have to be alone with that. Um, mm -hmm. because if that's really something that somebody is considering, I, um, it's a real experience and, um, yeah. So I try to support people with, um, with keeping hope alive in various ways, you know, naming what we do and don't know and all the possibilities that are out there. It can really, this can lead to really like black or white thinking understandably where there's not, you know, that attending attention of the gray areas about where all that possibility lies for people getting better. And so really trying to focus on that. Um, but yeah, it's really challenging. And I, I wish there was, I feel really helpless in this work a lot. Um, because I wish there was so much more that I could do. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredibly nuanced and yeah, I'd love to hear what your approach is to keeping people alive. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, we talk about it, um, and, um, I mean, I'm I'm also like you. If someone is considering medical assisted suicide, I'll 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 talk with them about it. Okay, you know, why is this why why is this an option? The the thing that I think maybe differentiates my conversations a little bit is that the protracted withdrawal injuries, in general, tend to have a better prognosis, at least from what I've seen. People tend to recover over it. So if we're talking about um, if someone's saying I'm in so much pain, you know, that I just want to, you know, go to Dignitas or Pegasus or any of those Swiss organizations, I'm going to fly over there. I'm just going to, you know, end it, you know, we, so we start talking about pain management. It's like, can I, you know, can we get rid of some of this pain with different drugs? You know, sometimes even we use opiate medications. And so it becomes much more of a symptomatic pain management thing. Like, how can I just keep you alive mm -hmm. while you heal? Um, so that's the medication side of it. The other piece of it is um, I think it's like family. I mean, probably the number one factor that I think keeps, you know, people alive is, you know, if they have someone that, that is with them, that can be yeah. with them and look after them in that as well, financial resources is also is very helpful and that can, can not, you know, and without those things, things get pretty difficult. As soon as you have like someone who has this injury and like the wife leaves and takes the kids and they're left in like a apartment on their own in, in, and they don't have financial resources and maybe they're not with their family. That's a really, really bad place. I mean, that yeah. is like an imminent place. Um, and, you know, every day people kind of disappear. So, so every day, and, and I don't know what happens to them. Um, and so, it's like, um, um, how do you build up their supports? And so that might be helping yeah. their family kind of understand what's, what's going through. Because as long as someone is at least talking to them and, you know, partially distracting them from, from the pain, you know, of, of these conditions, that helps a lot. Um, the next thing that I think is useful if people are at the level where their cognitive functioning has gotten to a place where they can actually, you know, use their brains productively for at least sh short bursts. It's to find meaning. Yeah. You know, you need to activism have like a life raft. Yeah. yeah. Activism. Or other meaning making, you know, art, creativity, so, some form of self-expression um, or contribution. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and, and it doesn't even have to be, oh, I'm going to go and talk about PSSD or protracted withdrawal yeah. injury. Like I have some, you know, some patients who are just like, um, you know, I think of one lady who has a spouse that's probably like 15 years older or something. Who's just like, I need to look after him when he gets older. You know, I need to stick around because he's caring for me now. And eventually he, he's going to need someone there for him. So, you know, there's a lot of different, things that people grab on to 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 survive so i i try and have conversations with them okay so you're completely blunted you're completely empty um you don't enjoy anything is is there a way is there any way that you feel like you could contribute you know that the world would be a better place with you doing things you know even though the joy isn't there and i mean 
from a philosophical perspective, I mean, I like I understand things like physician assisted suicide and, and things like that. And I believe people have the right to, to make their own choices about such, such things. But I will try and say, you know, even with this in, intense blunting, um, there is still a way for you to have a positive impact on the world. And if you want to endure the pain, you know, the world will be a better place with you in it. So, so we talk a lot about that. Um, and yeah, yeah. So that's, that's kind of the, the things that I look at, you know, building up their family and their supports, yeah. you know, finding meaning. Um, it's and, really and similar. I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Really similar to what I do. Yeah. Like finding, yeah. Finding what, what, what there is to live for um, finding meaning, finding, um, areas, whether, you know, what functioning they still really basing it on what functioning they still have. Like, unfortunately this condition can make it so that people like say, can't, mm, they were musicians, but now they don't have that connection to that musical, ex that capacity to enjoy and self-express through music, but maybe they still have a cognitive capacity. They still have the ability to learn something new. Um, so really like working with what capacities people that haven't been stripped from people. So what are the symptoms that you're not dealing with? What do you still have? And then working from there. So for example, um, you know, if somebody can't feel their genitals anymore, but they can still, you know, have some areas of sexual connection and exploration, working with what they do have and seeing what is possible there, or if people still have some capacity to, um, you know, for finding meaning is so challenging when people don't have access to their emotions, but connecting for some people, it's connecting to their former self before they were injured and knowing what that former self that's deep inside of them still somewhere um, you know, what they would want or what would be personally important to them in terms of what their contribution would be or their family obligations or duties. Um, you know, is it being able to be around to be the uncle that you want to be, you know, that you can show up to be a certain amount of the week or month? Is it, you know, just finding often it is to do with connection and community and finding purpose and contribution and so yeah, it's a lot easier if people just happen to have a social support system or family network that, um, you know, is supportive to them. And also activism for a lot of people, they doing, doing something that stops this from happening to other people um, is deeply meaningful. And so contributing to raising awareness, research, participating in research, participating um, in the efforts to alarm, uh, raise the alarm around this. It's really individual for each person. Um, yeah, it's, uh, is incredibly can be really incredibly enriching to find what can keep people ticking despite all of this. And I think there's something I've been so deeply moved and impressed by the, um, the desire and capacity that some people manage to access despite the um the lack of emotional and cognitive and sexual response they've been left with and that's not to say that if you can't if one who's suffering with this you know doesn't that's that's not how they're wired that's not you know they they, they can't grab on to some of these things there's really no right or wrong i don't want to shame anybody for you know, not being able to endure. Oh in God. Fine. If I yeah. was in a position like that, I mean, I'm, I would probably be thinking the same things in my head, you know, it's like, Oh, totally. No, no yeah. one really knows kind of the level of torture enduring that kind of never ends what it's like. And so it's just, yeah, I do think that's important as well. Just to, yeah, be able to talk about it at, 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 at least because it is, and it's trust building, like acknowledging, yeah. you know, like, well, you know, there's no shame if you decide you can't live anymore. Um, you know, theoretically, you know, <laughs> there's no, there. that's, that's super valid, you know, mm -hmm. and I think people, it can be so 
affirming and validating and trust building to have somebody actually say like, yeah, you know, if that's a choice you want to make, doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean you're wrong or bad. It's not, um, you know, there's so much shame and stigma around suicide and these kinds of things. Um, and so for people who've been so deeply, um, harmed and betrayed by the medical authority and people and yeah, people just in positions of authority in general throughout this experience of PSSD, um, to have somebody, you know, acknowledge and validate that, you know, if that is something that they make sense for them going forward to end things that, um, there is no shame there and it's really their choice and they, they get to decide. I encourage people to think, you know, I think there's a difference when somebody has been thinking about it for a really, really long time and their symptoms haven't changed um, rather than kind of just a sudden, like, Oh my goodness, I all of a sudden can't, can't cope mm-hmm. anymore. And I'm going to end it. You know, there's like, if, if it's coming from a really deliberate intentional place, you know, I think it's fair to treat it as we would any other condition that doesn't have a, that is result that creates immense systemic devastation and pain and stops people from living meaningful lives. And that doesn't have hope for resolution or treatment, just as we do with other so-called treatment resistant health conditions that people um, meet the criteria for assisted suicide with. Yeah. It's, I think it's on a, on a global level, it's really interesting that, you know, and just, um, you know, for, for context here, I'm pretty sure in North America, you know, a physician assistant suicide is only for people with six months left to live with a mm-hmm. condition that is progressive. And so th- those are the only conditions, but, you know, in places like Europe and Belgium and, and, yeah. and Switzerland, they take a different stance. You know, they say, well, I guess dignitas, the whole idea is, you know, people have the right to die with dignity, you know, and, yeah, and, I, I, don't, and I don't know, I haven't actually had someone go through with that, but I've had a lot, of, I've had people talk to me about it. And it's just like, there's an assessment with doctors and there's a board and they kind of talk about your condition, your condition. And, you know, they talk to mental health professionals and they do it kind of the way you'd want to. And I imagine they speak with your family and then I guess you go there with your loved ones and it's, uh, you know, done in a dignified way. Um, but yeah, when you work in this space, this is, uh, I mean, these are the conversations you do have. So, um, um, so we're, we're, we're getting close to the end of this. So I wanted to ask, do you, any, any final thoughts or parting comments um, about um, PSSD or working with this patient population? Um, yeah, I, I, oh my gosh, there's, there's so much. Um, but I guess what really um, comes to mind is uh, I'm just so ready for folks who are in positions, you know, counselors, psychiatrists, all healthcare professionals, the healthcare industry as a whole to start listening to people and validating their experiences and, um, and, and becoming, educating themselves on this. Um, it's really, really scary. The, the negligence and, 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 and uh, denial, um, I find it of healthcare providers. I find it easier for people to get diagnosed or listened to um, from healthcare providers who are not constantly writing these prescriptions day in and day out, such as gynecologists or neurologists or urologists. But it's there's the entrenchment of the 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 denial in um, the more mental health space, psychiatry, for example, where people are where and and general practitioners that are writing these prescriptions. Um, it really means something for, you know, if they're going to fully acknowledge that this actually exists and that they're going to, you know, the ethical thing to do is to have more fulsome conversations around the risks involved and call up all of their patients who are on these medications and tell them about this, et cetera, et cetera. That has really deeply massive implications for the practice. So the, the urge to trivialize this is a much greater not to paint everybody with the same brush, but amongst people who are doing certain roles rather than, or in medical settings where they're, um, they're not exactly writing these prescriptions day in and day out. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm really excited for what's possible when the awareness is spreads amongst 
um, healthcare professionals because there is so much harm, unnecessary harm um, that healthcare professionals are um, are creating um, by by compounding yeah compounding the devastation of this injury by by not believing people when they speak out about it um, and by continuing to prescribe people without actually giving them the access to informed consent that everybody deserves. So yeah, yeah, that's a big thing yeah. for me is holding our professions yeah. more accountable. Great. I, and I hope it happens soon. Um, and I just, so I want to say thank you so much for agreeing to come on and do this interview. Um, it's really nice to talk to someone on the front line, someone who is working with this um, this patient population, because um, I don't think a lot of people are doing this. Actually, let me <laughs> ask you this: who else is who else is working with people with PSSD? You're the first person I've talked to who's also working with this population. So it's yeah, deeply fascinating and mm. incredible opportunity to speak with you. I I don't know of any other. Uh, there's actually, there's one counselor in Ontario. I know of who is working with this population. I haven't interacted with her much. I don't know if she, she knows about it because she did um, a research project on it for her master's thesis, but I don't know if she's actually taking patients yet. She might be, her name is Emily Rice. So anybody in Ontario, Canada. Um, and then I've spoken with one counselor in the UK who's worked with one person with this condition. But apart from that, no, nobody who's worked with people on an ongoing basis who actually um, has, has uh, spoken with multiple, multiple folks. So you're the first and it's really great to connect with you. Okay. Well, yeah, same, same here. And uh, you know, thanks again and, and please keep in touch. Okay. I will. Thank you.